morning, Mountain View family. Good morning. Man, after that praise and worship, I'm ready just to spend time with the Lord. That was beautiful. And I get the privilege of enjoying that three times on a Sunday. So it's great. Big happy Father's Day. It's already been said to all the fathers here online with us as well. A very special welcome to each and every one of you today. If you're not aware here in the room that we are sharing in communion today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that table was set by the Lord Jesus Christ, not any individual church, that is for you. If you did not pick up one of those little portable chalices, I encourage you to grab one and one for your family. You can go to the back. There's someone in the back holding them right now for those if you, if you do not have them. So I'm going to jump in here today because if you've been with us for a while, we've been in a series called Signs, going through the Gospel of John, looking at the miracles through the Gospel of John. Today, I'm going to look at a passage of Scripture that can easily be overlooked as a sign. It shouldn't be, but it's easy to overlook as the miraculous. Uh, today, we're going to look indirectly at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We will not be at the place called the skull or Gargatha today. There will be no beatings, no trials, no wailings, no mockings, no death, no tomb. For in John chapter 12, you have your Bibles, you have your phones, you want to follow along with me, it'll be on the screen as well. But in that John chapter 12, Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem for the Passover. Many uh, Jews are following him there, many are on pilgrimage there to, follow, to celebrate the Passover. So in the city, there are observant Jews that are coming for the festival, but there are also Greeks present. There are Gentiles present as well. Many of these or some of these individuals have come for the Passover they're following the God of Israel. They're practicing the religion of Judaism. But yet, because they are Gentiles, there's only so far they can go in the celebration of the Passover. They will be stopped at the court of the Gentiles there at the temple. And there, this is where we pick up in verse 20, where a group of them are seeking Jesus out. This is the way it begins. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival, that being the Passover. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went on to tell, went to tell Andrew, and El Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. So Philip and Andrew go to tell Jesus that there are Greeks out there that are seeking a, a meeting with him. I would say, join the crowd. There's a lot of people that are seeking Jesus. There were some very religious Jews that were seeking Jesus at that moment to arrest him. There were other Jews that are out there, just kind of had a superficial interest in him. And there in the middle of these, there is a group of Gentiles that's pursuing Jesus. And I can't not see the irony in this, on both sides of him, his very people are missing the reason Jesus came to begin with. And this is just days, I believe, if I have my chronology right, that Jesus' own people would verbalize their rejection in their cry for his crucifixion. And yes, Israel's willful rejection would be sealed temporarily in divine judgment by God. Through Jesus Christ, he would turn to the Gentiles. We know that from Romans 10, 18, Romans eleven fifty two, 52. To the gospel and the commission would be given to the Gentiles to bear witness to his people and to all people around the world on the behalf of Jesus. We live in that era today. But as I backtrack from that for a moment, in a world of ever-growing anti-Semitism, please never take passages like this as an excuse to beat up on the Jews. You can't do that. We can't give up on Israel. God certainly has not. Let me backtrack for a moment. In Romans 9, 25 to 27, the apostle Paul is quoting from the prophet Hosea. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah to show that God will ultimately restore the people of God to the Lord God himself through faith in Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in Romans eleven twenty-five 25 and following. I want you to understand this mystery, Paul said, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles come to Christ, and so all Israel will be saved. We know the apostle Paul wrote, when he wrote the church of Ephesians, in chapter 2, that it was desired, these were God's given word given to the apostle Paul, 
That it was God's desire, God's ultimate purpose to create in himself, as King James would say, one new man. Other translations say one new humanity. Both Jew and Gentile together in one under the Lord Jesus Christ, we would call the church. That's Ephesians 2.15. God has not abandoned Israel. Please hear that. Paul is confirming or reaffirming the future salvation and restoration of Israel through faith in Jesus Christ. So I say to myself and I say to you, don't let anyone around you dismiss Israel from God's sovereign plans. He's not done. What exactly those plans are, how those will be executed in eschatology, that's hard to say, and in times, that's, that's kind of mysterious. Some things we know, some things we interpret, some things we speculate. But for me, the guarantees that were spoken of in Romans chapter 11 reveal God's faithfulness to his people Israel because he made eternal covenants with them in the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, and the new covenant that was prophesied to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31. I say all of this because Greeks were seeking Jesus at the moment. And they start their quest to get a meeting with Jesus by going to some of his disciples. The Bible says they go to Philip first. That makes sense in a lot of ways. Because Philip was from the area of Bethsaida in Galilee. That was the Gentile region known as the Decapolis. He probably not only spoke um, Hebrew, he also spoke Greek. So walking through the court of the Gentiles would have been easy for him and comfortable. And so they asked for a meeting from him. But he doesn't know what to do with that. So he goes to his brother Andrew, who's also from the same region he is, saying, hey, there's a bunch of Greeks out there that want to meet him with Jesus. What do we do? We say, that's kind of odd. Why would they say that? Because they've been discipled by Jesus. And in Matthew 10, we know that Jesus had already said, don't go the way of the Gentiles. And in Matthew 15, Jesus had told his disciples that I'm here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So now we got these Greeks that are asking for a meeting with Jesus and the two disciples go, well, I don't know. You know. What do we do with this? So together they go to Jesus to make the request. And here's how it goes down. In verse 23, a very peculiar response to a meeting with basically anybody. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I don't know about you, but this is a very interesting response to a request for a meeting. <laughs> Jesus' response is not directed specifically at Jews. It's not directed specifically at Gentiles or Greeks. But he's saying to every, this is really for everybody who will follow me. He says, my hour has come that the Son of Man will be glorified. This is the very first time Jesus has ever talked about the hour to come as something that's in the immediate and not something that will eventually come. The time is at hand. There were Jews who were looking at Jesus. He's going to be a reigning king. They're at home taking their farm instruments, and they're creating weapons out of them. And here Jesus responds to a meeting with a bunch of Greeks saying, look, there's going to be a death, and it's my death. The Jews were completely disconnected to what he was trying to say. And so basically saying, hey, Jesus, there's, the disciples come to him and says, look, there's some people out there that want to meet with you. I find it a very peculiar, imagine yourself for a moment. If you said to your, right, you text your spouse, hey, honey, can we have dinner uh, at lunch day? And, and all of a sudden your wife says, um, the hour has come for my, me to be glorified. And, or you reach out to your coworker and say, hey, can, can we grab dinner together or after the game tonight? And they say, uh, the kernel of wheat must fall to the ground and die or it remains a single seed. And you're thinking to yourself, um, I see you're busy, maybe next week. <laughs> it's peculiar. And it's like, what is he trying to say? But Jesus is basically saying to every single one of us here, and those with me online right now, 
that there will be no meeting with anyone. And I put this up here on the, on the screen for you, maybe you remember better. There is really no access to the glorious kingdom of God without the cross. You want to meet with me? You want to Google meet? You want a Microsoft meet? No access. No access to the glorious kingdom or to me or to God without the cross. Jesus says, I am the kernel of wheat that has to fall to the ground and die in order to produce meeting space for any of you Jews and any of you Gentiles that want to eternally meet with me. I've got to die on that cross to make that happen. That's where he's going. Jesus responds to a meeting request by the Greeks with a teaching that reminds every single one of us here, man, woman, and child, that the only way that we get to see Jesus, the only way we get to fellowship with him, to learn from him, acknowledge him, is to embrace the sacrificial death on the sign of the cross that he did for you and me. And what did it do? It atoned, big word, it paid fully for your sin, rebellions, and transgressions, and mine as well. That's what he's saying. No meeting with me unless it goes through the cross. I thought to myself, Jesus lived completely submissive to his Father's will. He refused to seek his own glory. Difficult for us to do sometimes. What do you say in the scripture? I'm going to read it for you. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, he said. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. That's hard enough. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. What about you and me? My father will honor the one who serves me. Now, I sat down and thought about that going, you could take that two verses, chapter 12, 25, and 26, put them on your bathroom mirror and say, those are my daily marching orders every day. Lord, do I get that right? If we're committed followers of Jesus Christ, those are our daily marching orders. Mountain View family, if you have chosen to live a life or if you're choosing to live a life today, and we've all been there and we all cycle back and circle back to it, but if we choose to live our life for our own interest, over the interest of the kingdom of God, we're ultimately going to lose. And we're going to lose out. Why? Because the things we're pursuing Heck, I mean, most of them are made in other countries. It's going to last 30 days, maybe. Maybe 60. You get a year warranty. Nothing's guaranteed being fabricated in this world to last forever. So if we're pursuing the things of this world that ultimately can't last, if they can't last already, they can't be eternally maintained. What are you going after? What are you and I pursuing on a day-by-day basis? But here's the thing. If you and I are pursuing our own interests, the challenge is, is that that's not, try again, that's not something that we just do on a personal level. We do that as a church. We come together and we want our way and we want to do our thing and that, that's natural, it's in the flesh. If you've read the book, I'm a church member, the reason we brought that up this summer is we want to read through it at both campuses, is that living for our own personal interests goes completely against the doctrine of what it means to be the body of Christ where we die to self and we function as a member of a body. You have to die to your own interest in order to live for the complete whole as a group. That's difficult to do. I encourage you, if you haven't got the book, get it, get it on Kindle, read it. It takes 60, actually 77 minutes on Audible to listen to the entire book. But Jesus said that if we hate our life in this world, and that's hard. I mean, hate, I don't want to hate anything. But he said, if you hate your life in this world, then you're going to gain it. What's he mean by hate? I like the word subjugate. I don't know why I like it so much, but I go right there. I say, I believe he's saying, if I choose to subjugate my interests, my passions, and synonyms for that are crush, conquer, or defeat, or maybe an easier way to say it is to prioritize where they belong. Because we all have interests. We all have passions. But if we're willing to subjugate our fleshly desires and appetites for Christ and serve his interests, then God says to us in the world that what he gives us as a result of that not only lasts for the life that we live, but they can be eternally maintained. That which Christ says, I'll give you if you put me first, will be there for you in eternity. What are we living for? The now or for tomorrow? 
Now we may nod our heads, and I thought, well, you know what? People go, yeah, yeah, that's right. And I'd probably do the same thing if I was sitting where you are right now. But that means that all my possessions, all our goals, all our plans, all our desires, all our preferences. Jesus even said in Luke 14, 27, even our own life put before those things. If we don't carry a cross, Jesus Christ said you can't be his disciple. Now I thought, well, how do I apply this? How do I make illustrations of this? Now, I couldn't think of some great ones in my own life, but I have a friend. He walks closely with the Lord. He's bigger than life. His wife of many years passed away a couple years ago. Here's the man who walks with the Lord. Uh, and when God speaks to him, well, through the word, and he got a nudge when I said, I'm careful when I use the word God speak. When he feels a nudge in the Lord to respond to somebody, to go talk to somebody, he's there. Doesn't even stop. He's trained himself to say, Lord, if you're in this, I'm going. He shared a story with my wife and I a couple weeks ago that before his wife passed away that they went on a, a trip to an island. And I think to myself, if you're going to go to island, you're spending big money, and I want the agenda set Monday through Friday, everything I'm going to do. I want to get my money's worth, right? So they went to this island. They wanted to see all these things. And he tells the story. They set aside five days. But once they got there, God opened up assignment after assignment for him and his wife to minister to staff at this particular resort. And before long, long conversations turned into ministry opportunity, which turned into salvations, and those salvations turned into a mini revival on that resort that it caused them to extend their vacation two more days. They never left the resort. Maybe you say, woe is me, you're on an island on a resort, it's pretty good, right? But they were there for many other things. In the middle of that fifth day, my friend sat down and began to think about why he was there to begin with. And he began to bemoan the fact of, wait a second. What am I missing out on? That grandiose waterfall, I'm not going to get to see. That sea life where we were going to go snorkeling, I'm not going to get to enjoy that. He began to say that stuff out loud, and his wife stopped him just like that. She turned to him and said, we were never here for those things. God had you and me here to minister to the staff of this resort, period. Now, you may think, well, that's pretty extreme. I'm not asking you to judge the illustration. But can we say, dying to something, to gain something else, can you and I say to ourselves, it's Jesus over my vacation plans, even here at the beginning of the summer? That's hard. Giving up everything may not be required of you and me, but we still need to be willing to give up everything to follow Christ. That's what he's saying. And Jesus didn't pull any punches with them when the time came for him to say, look, this is what an honored life looks like. Look in John chapter 12 with me for a second. Verse 26, I'll share these words again. Whoever serves me, Jew or Gentile, must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. It reminds me of my friend. He didn't go to the waterfall. He stayed on the resort doing what God asked him to do. My father will honor the one who serves me. So I took the opposite approach to that first time I read it a couple weeks ago. I said, if I'm committed to serving myself, don't expect God's honor. I don't know if that's a fair assessment or not. That's what came to mind. I mean, we might get all of us in doing things that we enjoy doing. You might get the honor and the adulation. You might even get the worship of some people. But at what cost? What's it going to cost you if you live completely for yourself 24-7? All human honor. This is what Jesus was trying to say in the words he responded to a simple meeting with the Greeks. All human honor pale in comparison and significance to the eternal honor that God bestows on those who love and serve him. What are you and I passionate about every single day? Yeah, we got trophies. Yeah, we got awards. Yeah, we got things that hang around our neck. I got pickleball friends and they here. You got plenty of those things hanging around your neck. They're great. Talent is talent. We celebrate that. But at the end of the day, what do we do with that? I got trophies still from the 80s in my garage. I can't get rid of them. I mean, they got dirt and stuff all over them. They're embarrassed by looking at them, but I still look at them. <laughs> I remember those days. Winners we were. Nobody else remembers. Nobody else cares. <laughs> but we have all these trophies. All these awards, all these things sitting there. I thought to myself, take all your trophies. Take all your honorable mentions. Take all your Grammys, those who get them in Emmys and Tonys. And remind yourself 
their priority and their value in comparison to the honor of God. And the Apostle Paul said, in that perspective, everything we earn is rubbish, he said. Compared to the all-surpassing glory of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord, Philippians 3.8. So Jesus said, my father will honor the one who serves me. Am I speaking to that person in this room today? What about online? Less than a week after Jesus spoke these words, he would die as God's once and for all perfect and complete sacrifice for sin of God's chosen. Now, in view through that sacrifice, he would abolish the social and cultural barriers that previously had separated Jews and Gentiles from Christ himself. So therefore, at that moment, all people, Jew and Gentile would come to Christ through the cross, not culture. Never again, but only through the cross. Neither the Jewish culture nor the Gentile culture save anybody. They can point, but they can't save. People come to Christ through faith, not festivals, secular or sacred. You may be asking the question right now, why would you consider this a sign? Because in our culture today, Jew or Gentile, We're still looking for signs. Anything to make us feel comfortable. I start with Israel. The Bible says we're called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We don't get out of that one. That's a mandate, I believe, for even believers today. That we're called to do that. And I thought, one of the ways I pray, I pray for a democratic nation sitting in the midst of I don't care what nation it would be, it just happens to be Israel, but I pray for a democratic nation city in the midst of a people with visceral hatred for their very existence. I pray for their safety and security. But on a spiritual level, many over there are still looking for signs. They're looking for signs of the coming Messiah, and he's already come, blinded to the truth, and yet it's right in front of them. We should be praying for those individuals. So I say on a spiritual level, I pray for the secular and religious Jews and Gentiles who call Israel home, but their hearts would run to self-glory and hunger for the glory that comes through all things except Jesus. I pray for them because many of them are still looking for signs, as I said. We talk about signs. There are things still happening in eschatology and prophetic word that I believe will come to pass. So they're still looking for the signs of the of building of, rebuilding of the third temple and the red heifers that are being collected even to this day, that one that would be sacrificed, biblical prophecy, that some would say would come to pass. They're still looking for those signs. Okay, so there's signs that I believe that are there that will point to the soon coming Christ. But stop looking for other signs and point to the one and understand the one that they need more than anything. That's the cross. Jew and Gentile alike. I realize that Messiah is being drawn and we need to be drawn closer to him. The cross for me is a blinking yellow road sign. We want to make an analogy out of that. Every single one of us in this room, we have to face the cross. Every Jew in Israel, every Gentile in Israel has to face the cross. If Jesus didn't die on the cross, hear me, if you hear nothing else. If Jesus didn't die on the cross, there would be no substitute for your sin or mine. No substitute. No substitute, no salvation. No salvation, no hope. No hope, the only future that exists after that would be hell. That's it. Now imagine this, the best day you've ever lived, if you can think of it, the best day, 24 hours you've ever lived, you get to live that day every single day for the rest of your earthly life. No substitute, but without a substitute, no salvation, no salvation, no hope, no hope. The only future you have after a lifetime of the perfect day is hell itself. That's all that's left without Christ and the cross. Think about what he's done for you and for me. Jesus said, you think about sin, verse 27 and 28. Now my soul is troubled, Jesus said. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven, talking about the miraculous. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. As a church, we recently studied through the book of Hebrews. You may remember in Hebrews 12, where it says in the word of God that Jesus, he endured the cross. But the piece of the sentence that followed that was, 
He scorned or despised its shame because sin brings shame. Jesus understands that. Jesus Christ was the one who was willing to go to the cross, not for my sin alone, but your sin as well. And we think, okay, he bore our sin. Difficult sometimes to understand that, but our shame, we all understand that. Shame is heavy. And when we don't get it out and we don't share it with somebody else, I think King David said it'll just rot the bones. That's what happens. Jesus Christ took upon himself all of our sin for all time and all of its shame. Imagine the weight of that. And the Bible says in that moment, he was troubled. Imagine that. Take it upon himself, all that. The word is, let me go look it up. It's fun to look up words in the Greek. The different way it can mean to shake or to unsettle. I like that word unsettle. So I said to myself, my sin unsettled the Son of God. Whew. That got my attention. And it ought to unsettle us. And why do I share that? Because way too many times, you and I, in our world day, we live detached from our sin. Whatever. Jesus never did. He took it upon himself and it unsettled him. And the Bible said in this part, in the prayer, go ahead and put it back up, 28. Father, in the midst of what I'm about ready to do on the sign of the cross, which every Jew and Greek and Gentile needs, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. I'll glorify it again. The third time in the history of the Gospels, the God of heaven had spoken audibly into the world. Jesus' baptism, Jesus' transfiguration, and now today. And in that moment, many others thought they'd be hearing thunder, but God came to absolutely say in that moment, I honor my son, and he affirmed his son right there. And so he speaks about your sin and mine, and he says to the disciples who had asked if the Greeks could meet with him, he said these words, spoken, I believe, even to us today. Now is time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world, referring to Satan himself, will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. But a month ago, when we took communion the very last time together, I said that little chalice that you hold in your hand, go ahead and pull that out if you like. That little chalice we hold in our hand kind of signifies our eternal hope. Because everything that was done that's represented by the bread and the juice that represents his blood reminds herself of a hope that cannot separate us from the cross. That's what you and I have. When Jesus is lifted up, which is represented there by the cup, I realize that judgment came on all rebellion. When I hold that cup, which I'll pick mine up in a minute, I realize that it represents the cross and what happened there. And I remember in that moment, all rebellion. Every bit of it, mine, yours, your children, and your grandchildren. If, if Jesus lingers and doesn't return soon, all of it, every bit of it was taken and judged by Christ in that moment. And I realized that at the cross, imagine this. At the cross, Satan and his demons lost their totalitarian grip and authority and influence on the world. He is the prince of the world today, the Bible calls him. He has authority in this world, not authority over Christ, but he has an authority. And I realized in that moment when Jesus came at birth, I love the way of looking at it, and we got the cups. If you don't have it, you can raise your hand if you like one. Satan's temporary domain in this world was invaded by Jesus at the manger. It was judged and destroyed at the cross. Mount View, hear me for a moment. Where Jesus is allowed to reign, Satan has no other place left to rule. I'm talking about your heart and mine. Folks, he can reign in this world all he wants. He just doesn't get permission to reign and rule right here if we don't give it to him. Where we allow Christ to rule, Satan doesn't have a place to reign anymore. If you think about eschatology for a moment, different people interpret it different ways. I'm just going to share what I believe to be true. During the coming tribulation, and the Bible talks about that, life gets really dark in our world. 
Satan, I don't know why he still has access. Romans 12, 10 says at that moment for the tribulation begins, Satan will be cast completely out of heaven for all time. Yes, he's been cast out of heaven, but he still he gets the opportunity to come before the Lord, the accuser of the brethren. Why? I don't completely understand that, but the Bible says at that time, Satan will be cast out of heaven to which he's had access to accuse the brethren. At the end of the tribulation, Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit during the millennial reign. That's Revelations 21 through 3. And finally, at the end of the millennium, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire where he would punish for all eternity. That's Revelations 12.10. And that's what's the case of the world. Think about the cross for Satan's perspective. We're going to take communion going, thank you for the cross. Satan was saying that too. Thank you for the cross. Because Satan's apparent victory at the cross is really, in reality, marked his absolute defeat. Because the one he had killed on the cross by the power of God, rose again from the dead, validating who he was, freeing us from the bondages of sin and death. That's why we get the opportunity to share in communion today. Take that little piece of bread out. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we take the opportunity in confession and repentance to come before the Lord, recognize that we don't want to make light of this. He encouraged people. matter of fact, the Apostle Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, do not take this in an unworthy manner. There's a lot of interpretations for that. For me, clearly, I'm saying, Lord, if I got, if I got known sin in my life, before I, take this, before I take what represents your body and your blood, saying that, God, I believe in what you did for me, I'm at least going to own the fact that I acknowledge the sin in my life. So I don't care if you take the time right now to bow your head and say, God, me and you, we got to do business together. I encourage you to do that. Because when I hold this cup in my hand, I realize that Jesus Christ had been lifted up from the earth, first at the cross, And then at the resurrection, and then I realized at that moment, as Jesus spoke an answer to the disciples for the Greeks that wanted an appointment with him, I realized there is no access. You're holding a piece of bread that represents the broken body of Messiah Jesus that died on the cross for your sin and mine. And I think about that, you and I, because of the cross of Christ, I can have access to God 24-7. We take that for granted. Jesus Christ said there in John chapter 12, no access. No access to me apart from the cross. There at the Passover meal, Jesus took the, uh, the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, broken for you, to get access to you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. When I take the cup, and because we do it often, I never want it to lose its beauty, and I hope it never does for you. If you take a moment right now, those online, they may take the camera and swing it to the cross, if you would, one of them. I want you to look at the cross for just a second. You hold that little plastic chalice in your hand that has a little bit of grape juice in it, representing what was spilled from the body of Christ that would atone for and cover a multitude of sin. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there will be no forgiveness of sin, yours or mine. Jesus did what was going to be expected of you and me. He did it in your place. That's how much he loves you. When I looked at this cup, and I thought about what Jesus said as a response to the disciples' request for the Greeks to meet with him, and I turned my attention back to the cross in my mind, I thought about my sin and my transgression that he bore on the cross and I saw this cup as divine forgiveness. That's what I saw. Complete divine forgiveness. In our world, it's easier to say, I forgive you. It's almost impossible to forget. But for the Lord God Almighty, the Lord says, I will remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. We sing a song about the sin going into a sea that has no bottom. Praise God for it. You have been in Christ. Hear me. And if you don't know this and you're hearing this for the first time, this ought to give you the reason to celebrate until you go to bed tonight. When you embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have been eternally forgiven. Jesus Christ took the cup at the Last Supper. He passed it around to his disciples. And he said, this is my body. This is, my, this is my blood. 
sealing a brand new covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. Take and drink, he said, in remembrance of me. The band can come join me. Father God, thank you. We say thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have access to you. Because right now, because we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, and for any in this room who's never done that, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what Christ did on the cross at that moment, not only atones for, it pays fully for your sin. It takes away sin, it takes away shame, it takes away regret, and it gives you 24-7 access into the presence of a holy God. Because His Spirit comes to live in you. It's a beautiful thing. It's a miraculous thing that happens with the sign of the cross. And in that moment when we have a need, when we have a concern, God, we thank you that we can come to you. And because of the blood of Christ that covers the multitude of sin, you basically would say to us, I know it's cliche in our world, but I'd say, Lord, I want to meet with you. And God, you might say to us, your place or mine. God, you're intimately connected. So Father, I pray right now for anyone in this room who has never surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know your story. Maybe you think you have. Maybe you think you should have. Maybe you grew up in the church you don't know. God knows. There was ever in the time in your life where you said, God, I acknowledge that I'm not God. And I trust that the one you sent, your son, did something on the cross that I could never do for myself, and that was die for my own sin. You took away my shame. You took away that body of sin. And for the first time in my life, some of you may need to say this to God right now. For the first time in my life, I'm saying to you, God, I believe in your son. I, I knew your son in my head, but I believe in my heart. I trust that it is Jesus coming into my life that can transform, make me new from the inside out. I've tried behavior modification. It doesn't work. Last for a week, then it's gone. Jesus, I need you. Then say to him, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Take Set up shop in my heart, Lord. It lead me as you would lead me. Father, I pray for what you're doing in the hearts of those that are miraculously saying that to you today. And I pray that they would speak to someone before the end of this day, letting them know of the great decision they've made to allow you to lead their life. Father, as we prepare to sing this last song together, maybe a song of repentance, maybe a song of, of gratitude for what you have done on our behalf. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God, we stand